the earliest written laws from very different contexts and parts of the world all dealt with slavery. It was clearly a widespread phenomenon, from China to India to the Middle East to classical Greece and Rome up to the European Middle Ages. Slavery was a social fact. And in all these contexts, lawmakers tried to manage and clarify the many complicated issues that arose from the state of slavery. How you could become a slave, or cease to be one. The consequences of this, the capacity of slaves to hold property or to marry, their relations with others, particularly if they produce children, and duties of others towards slaves. It's clear that the boundaries of the category of slavery were often uncertain, and people could move between different types of dependency and freedom. Not all the laws use a single concept. Some made a distinction between slaves and concubines or other types of bound labour. Others used a simple category without being at all specific about what it meant and who counted. So slavery was never a simple social phenomenon. Yet, the lawmakers rarely tried to define it. We think of law as something that creates social order by, among other things, putting people and things into categories so the relations among them can be clarified. Yet the laws on slavery rarely attempted this in any comprehensive way. And when they did, the definitions were often very simplistic. In classical Rome, which had an immense slave population, many of whom were freed, laws just declared that everybody was either a slave or not. And Islamic lawyers declared that people were free if they were not a slave. So these simple binaries hardly represented the underlying reality. Why did lawmakers resort to such simple definitions? I want to suggest that the basic state of slavery, at least in its most extreme form, arose widely without any legal intervention. In the aftermath of a war or a context, people would be carried away, captured, physically removed from their homes, their networks of social support, denied status and rights. And none of this needed any legal intervention, just the physical act of, act of capture, transport and confinement. And this provided the basic idea of what slavery was and the cir circumstances in which people really could be treated as property. It didn't need a legal definition. But it was a difficult state to maintain. Slaves built up social relations. They developed useful skills. They had children. It was difficult to continue to treat them merely as pieces of property. And it was the lawmakers that came in to create rules to deal with these difficult situations and it blurred the boundaries of what slavery was. It also raised the difficult question of what it meant to be free. Difficult to find divine slavery without specifying its opposite. And although now we take the concept of freedom for granted, it was far from true in many societies of the past. The historian Moses Finley even suggests that before they had slavery, ancient Greeks had no concept of freedom. So what we find in the laws is people grappling with different difficult issues about degrees of dependency and the complications of the status, and then resorting to a simple binary, which may have been a way of hanging on to the basic status, presumably because it suited the privileged and the powerful. At the same time, making laws for slavery also forced people to think about what it meant to hold other people in a state of dependency. The laws effectively legitimated these relations, but to draw a line between slavery and freedom meant facing up to the fact that they had choices about how they as a society treated different classes of people. Making laws raised fundamental issues about what sort of society people lived in, who they were as civilised people, and the answers weren't always comfortable. So in this presentation, I want to examine and compare material from some of the earliest laws from Mesopotamia, Israel, China, India, Rome, the Islamic world. I'm looking at basic provisions, which are often quite brief. And these broad racing comparisons are not so much to explore the social and economic reality, the nature of slave societies and how they arose. <coughs> but my interest is more in the ideas that people, especially lawmakers, used to describe and discuss slavery. What do their categories and rules, such as they are, tell us about their societies? What conclusions can we draw from the fact that they clearly found it so difficult to define what slavery was? So my first example is from Mesopotamia, um, what is now largely Iraq and Syria. And it's from here that there survived some of the very earliest written laws. The earliest written laws 
um, which survived from the Third Kingdom of Ur in the third uh, millennium uh, BC. Mesopotamia was then a fertile, productive region, centre of flourishing trade networks, and Ur was an empire of city-states. But there was frequently warfare among them, so the earlier slaves were probably war captives. The Mesopotamians also developed writing. The scribes used uh, styluses to press marks on clay tablets, lots of which in the dry climate survive. And among them are some which record how prisoners of war were brought in to replace existing slaves who were themselves being drafted into the army. The majority of slaves were probably owned by palaces and temples, which are the major landowners and economic powers. But there was also a cl large class of poor citizens, and many documents re record sales of children, presumably by desperate parents who couldn't afford to maintain them. The wealthy could obviously acquire ch ch child slaves from fellow citizens to supplement their own family's labour. This, of course, was debt bondage, a different form of slavery. And, in Mesopotamia as elsewhere, it wasn't a permanent state. Some documents record how slave, slaves claimed freedom, generally on the basis they'd earned it by working for long enough to pay off the debt that put them into slavery in the first place. The most complete set of Mesopotamian laws comes from the time of Hammurabi, who ruled Babylon and much of Mesopotamia a few centuries later in the 1770s BC. Um, he was engaged in constant raids and warfare and gradually conquered most of the surrounding area. This map actually shows his conquests in the area. Um, and he established Babylon as a rich, prosperous and splendid city. So many Babylonian slaves were probably war captives. And towards the end of life, he commissioned this grand law stone, which is now in the Louvre Museum in Paris. You see at the top, it's got a picture of Hammurabi on the left, Sitting, standing in front of the god of the sun, who's presumably giving him authority to make the laws. So among other things, this great law stone was a statement of imperial dignity. And the long introduction to the laws describes his conquests and declares that he's bringing justice to his people. And then there are about 280 detailed laws at the, towards the bottom and on the back. So among them, there are quite a few laws on slavery. And some treat slave, slaves as property of their masters. If a slave was injured, compensation had to be paid, not to him, but to his master. It was an offence to assist a runaway slave. They had identifying marks, because barbers committed a crime if they removed it. There was a register of slaves in the temple. So these were probably war captives, treated as property, as chattels. But Babylonian slaves could also integrate into society. The child of a female slave and her master, the law said, could be adopted by the master, become his heir along with his other children. And if, even if he didn't do this, when he died, both the child and the mother were to be free. So there was a relatively quick route out of slavery, at least for some. And the laws also restricted the enslavement of Babylonian citizens. Debt bondage was limited to three years. And if someone bought a slave somewhere else, who could later prove they were originally a citizen of Babylon, they had to go free. Babylonians, that is, couldn't enslave their own. So in Mesopotamia, slavery was a fact. Populations of con conquered cities were regularly enslaved. So I'm just recalculating the time. <laughs> okay. Um, Populations of conquered cities were reg regularly enslaved and reduced to a state of dependency, treated as the property of their masters. And it was also a fact that extreme poverty could lead to debt bondage. People could effectively sell themselves or children to work off a debt. And this was recognised and condoned by the laws. But the lawmakers also recognised that bonds of affection could build up between slaves and masters. And they could thus cross the line from outsider to insider, and children could become kin. And they did offer to some protection, though notably to Babylonian citizens. So in the prologue and the epilogue to his laws, Hammurabi, Hammurabi makes great claims that he's bringing peace and justice to all his people. All who look at my stone, he says, in future generations will know they can get justice. But in reality, the laws protected Babylonian citizens differently from outsiders. They weren't exactly defining freedom, but they were marking out what it meant to belong. Only citizens had the full protection of the king's justice. So some centuries later, and further to the east, we find the writers of the Pentateuch, 
the early books of the Old Testament, the Bible, also grappling with slavery. Of course, it's difficult to use the Old Testament as evidence of anything. Its writing is shrouded uncertainty. These early books were probably put together over several centuries, incorporating texts from older times. But still, we can draw a few conclusions, at least how the Israelites thought about slavery in the first millennium BC. So there are many references throughout the Pentateuch. The Israelites and their neighbours obviously kept slaves. The books of Exodus describes how Moses led the Israelites from Egypt, and when they reached the Promised Land, God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and a set of laws. And these laws start with rules on slavery. Chapter 21, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he's to serve you for six years, but in the seventh year he shall go free without paying anything. If he comes alone, he'll go free alone. If he has a wife when he comes, she is to go with him, and so on. And then verse 5, but if the servant declares, I love my master and my wife and children and do not want to go free, then his master must take him before the judges. He shall take him to the door or the doorpost and pierce his ear with an awl, and then he will be a servant for life. So these were obviously other Israelis in debt bondage. And the laws restricted the length of term to six years. But if a slave chose to remain at the end, presumably because he thought the prospects of being self-sufficient again were remote, and it was better for him to stay in servitude, then he had to declare it and be marked. The presumption was for freedom. Someone who chose otherwise had to be marked. On the other hand, it was different for women. If a man sells his daughter as a servant, she's not to go free as male servants. But if she doesn't please the master who selected her for himself, he must let her be redeemed. He has no right to sell her to foreigners because he's broken faith with her, etc. In other words, if women were sold, presumably to be wives or concubines, they didn't go free after six years, but they had to be properly treated. They couldn't be sold to somewhere else. They couldn't be treated like war captives. And then in the book of Leviticus, we find more explicit rules on slavery and, and a direction effectively they should be limited to non-Israelites. So it starts in verse 39, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and sell themselves to you, in other words, debt bondage, do not make them work as slaves. They're to be treated as hired workers or temporary residents among you. Then, and they are to work for you until the year of the Jubilee. Here, 50 years, which is slightly less generous than the Exodus is rule about six. And then they're there and their children are to be released. Um, and then it finishes in verse 42, because the Israelites are my servants, who are my servants, whom I brought out of Egypt, they must not be sold as slaves. So here the writers are clearly talking about chattel slavery, which is res restricted to outsiders, probably war captives, who are different then from Israelites in debt bondage. Chattel slaves had to be foreigners. And it ends, your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them you may buy slaves. And you mustn't rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly. So they were distinguishing debt bondage from the enslavement of war captives. Debt bondage obviously was bad enough. Um, but there were rights of redemption and an underlying injunction that they shouldn't be ruled over ruthlessly. In practice, the lands of Israel and Jordan in the first millennium BC were the scene of considerable warfare, conquest, and populations moving around. The Israelites were famously taken into captive in Babylon. Slavery and debt bondage were facts. But the Pentateuch, among other things, were defining what it meant to be an Israelite. Wherever they lived, they had ritual obligations. There were dietary rules, which distinguished them from other populations. And the rules on slavery are part of this. They limited how they could treat one another. Like Hammurabi's laws, they were defining what it meant to belong. Now to China. In much the same period, although much further east, China, Chinese rulers were beginning to write down their laws. This was the Warring States period, a time of considerable instability and no central government. But the rulers who managed to establish some power and central control were writing down lists of offences and punishments on bamboo strips. 
Law in China took a distinctive form. It was a matter of discipline. It was about imposing order rather than creating rules in a religious concept, context like Israel. And throughout this period, barbarians, particularly from the south, were regularly captured and enslaved. But the laws of the Chinese rulers were more concerned with penal slavery. So when the Qin managed to centralize power in the third century, just to give you an idea of the their extent of their power, they introduced a harsh new legal regime under the guidance of the legalist scholar Lord Zhang. Under this legal regime, people who committed serious crimes were sent into penal servitude. This was the most extreme form of punishment below execution. It effectively meant you had to work as a slave, generally for the state. The Qin rulers had embarked on a great project of state building. They were constructing roads and canals and bridges and palaces, and they needed an army of laborers, which they got from the punishment of criminals. So the laws deal primarily with these penal slaves. They recognize that wives and children of a convict should also be enslaved. Women would be sent to work as corn grinders, probably a metaphor of domestic slavery, again, probably to serve the state and its projects. In practice, the Qin regime didn't last long. It was followed by the Han and then another unsettled period before the Tang again um, centralized government in the 6th to the 9th centuries. You can see it here the extent of the Tang dynasty. By now, the laws were much more complicated. And the Tang created an immense legal code. It had complicated rules about who slaves could marry, the children of mixed marriages. Punishment of slaves, for example, was in the hands of the master, but he wasn't allowed to kill a slave without official permission. <coughs> and slaves and their family members regularly appear in the rules as people who should be punished, either to the same degree as ordinary people, or more harshly, depending on the context. And they also drew, drew a distinction in terms of the wrongs committed against them. An ordinary person might be kidnapped, but it was theft to carry off a slave. In other words, they were property. And several times the laws state that the slaves are the same as property, and there's evidence of slave markets. And they regularly make a simple distinction between slaves or base people and ordinary or good people. So kidnapping, coercion, and sale of a good person, a non-slave, was a very serious crime. And if good people sold themselves or family members into slavery, i.e. debt bondage, they retained their status as good. So the law said a purchaser couldn't resell one of them as if they were base, a slave. But what did it mean to be good or ordinary person? There was no concept of personal freedom in traditional China. People existed in webs of social relations with ob obligations to parents, teachers, officials, and the emperor. And in practice, there were also people with status between slaves and the good, as the laws themselves make clear. There were bound retainers in service of government officials or private individuals, themselves classified into different sub subcategories, depending on their duties. And the laws provided that the bound retainers could be transferred to a new master, but couldn't be sold. And although there were possibilities of manumission, they didn't entirely end the, ob end the obligations to the former master. So the situation was in practice much more complicated than simple binary or slave good would suggest. Why did the laws insist on it and the state that all slaves were property? Well, the Chinese were probably initially concerned to restrict the most extreme forms of slavery to outsiders, the captured barbarians, rather like the laws of the Hammurabi and the laws of the Pentateuch. And the base good distinction probably re reflects this, insiders, outsiders. But by the Tang, the, result, the reality was much more complicated, much more complicated set of statuses and relations of dependence. So the lawmakers were dealing with these complications, trying to regulate society, to bring order to a developing social hierarchy, to bring practices of slavery under official control. But they also clearly tried to hang on to the more simple distinction, um, the more straightforward idea about slavery, probably because it suited the officials to have control over a slut class of slave laborers. So one scholar did suggest that only officials should keep slaves, not merchants or other commoners, on the basis that all people were the good, presumably all Chinese rather than barbarians, were the good people of the emperor, 
so they shouldn't be attached to a small household where they would suffer pitiful extremities and injustice without means of redress. In other words, they use the idea of slavery to conceptualize a minimal sense of freedom or rights, while also insisting on the hierarchy between state officials and other citizens. So in many ways, the Mesopotamian kings, the writers of the Pentateuch and the Chinese lawmakers were doing similar things. Both debt bondage and the enslavement of war captives were simply facts. But the laws were trying to restrict practices of debt bondage, giving them rights of redemption, trying to limit chattel slavery to outsiders. On the other hand, while the Israelites were mainly concerned to distinguish themselves from other people, which meant following correct moral and religious rules, the Chinese lawmakers were more concerned to control and regulate a complicated social hierarchy and maintain a class of slaves who worked for the state and its officials. Though not surprisingly, the laws in India were very different. By the time the Tang came to power, the Hindu Brahmins had collected wisdom, ritual and guidance and rules for everyday life into sets of laws, the Dharma Shastras. So here, are back just slightly earlier in the second century, um, you can see the Han Empire, the precursor of the Tang. Here's the Kushan Empire, who wasn't very long lived in India. This is the time at which lots of the Dharma Shastras were written, although they had much earlier um, precedents. Parthians, you can see already the Roman Empire as well, which I'll come to um, in a minute just to give you a sense of the sort of the global spread of the slavery I'm dealing with. Um, so the Dharma, Dharma Shastras, created from about the second century of the Common Era onwards, were all shaped by ideas about caste. So in some ways they were like biblical laws, their rules described duties, status of all Hindus, they gave guidance for ritual practices and many aspects of daily life. But everything was related to caste. As we know, there are four basic castes, the Brahmins, the ritual specialists, the Kshatriya, the warriors and kings, the Vaishyas, the ordinary people, and the Shudra, the servants. And different laws applied to each. Most extensive of the Brahmins had complicated rules of ritual purity and lengthy rules for the Kshatriya about how they should govern. The rules for the ordinary people and the Shudra are much more brief. And the Prashudra, it said, primarily had to act as servants for the higher caste. So this is a small extract from Manu's Code of Law, um, which is one of the earliest and most famous. Um, the king should make the Vaishyas pursue, pursue trade, money lending, agriculture and cattle herding, and make the Shudras engage in the service of the Brahmins. And elsewhere, um, the laws define Shudra as those created to do slave labour. In practice, slavery was a separate category among the Shudra class, but all servants were always supposed to act as servants to cater to the needs of the upper classes. Um, and Manu carries on by stating there were seven different ways of becoming a slave. War capture, penal servitude, self-slavery, and inherited status. So it wasn't, unlike the earlier laws we've been looking at, drawing a sharp distinction between captives and others. Obviously, the idea that some people could become slaves through self-sale rather contradicted the idea that people were born into a caste. In effect, the lawmakers and, yeah, and another provision states that even when he's released by his master, a shooter is not freed from his slave status, for that is innate in him and who can remove it from him. So in effect, it seems the lawmakers were trying to na naturalise status differences to impose it the structure of castes onto rather more complicated social relations. And Manu also carries on to deal with the complications that arise from the state of slavery, some of which are familiar. Mixed marriages, the ownership of children, whether slaves could give testimony, whether Brahmins could accept food served by slaves. So in some ways, the Dharma Shastras are brutally honest. They recognise differences in status and occupation between different classes, and they try to naturalise and entrench them. They're also honest, and they recognise that wives, sons, pupils, and younger brothers, even of the highest castes, could in some ways be in the position of slaves. All of them could be beaten, although not on the head. And like slaves, wives and sons could not own property. <laughs> 
So it seems to me that like the Chinese emperors, the Hindu Brahmins are trying to simplify and impose a logic on rather complex social relations. And their approach was to reduce everything to caste, to naturalize social status. Degrees of freedom were related to caste, along to some extent with age, gender, and marital status. In the process, the status of slaves, itself a social fact, was projected onto the whole of the Shudra caste. So, before turning to Rome, we've seen that the status of slavery arises widely without law, most frequently from capture and debt bondage. And everywhere it seems to cause similar practical problems, which the laws address. But while Hammurabi and the writers of the Pentateuch were more dis concerned to distinguish those who belonged or not, the Chinese laws were more concerned to establish and regulate a class of penal slaves, while the Brahmins were creating a social hierarchy within their own society. And things become even more complicated in Rome and the Islamic world. So, with at least two Roman scholars in the audience, I embark on saying anything about Rome with great trepidation, particularly because a, such a lot has been written about Rome and Roman slavery. Still, I do want to say something about it. Um, so, very roughly, during the Republic, roughly the 5th century um, to BC to the early centuries of the Common Era, Rome expanded its territories, it sent armies throughout Italy and overseas, and large numbers of war captives poured in. Here's a victory column which shows Trajan accepting the surrender of the Dacians, many of whom would obviously go into slavery in Rome. Um, and the laws from this period begin to talk of them as property. But over time, they began to reproduce and form a self-sustaining class. And so by the early empire, birth to a slave mother, mother was the most common route into slavery. Some of them worked in kitchens. Female slaves could attend their mistresses. Others worked in mines and on agricultural states. So over time, difference, differences appeared am among the slaves. Many of them acquired useful skills. They became trusted to perform important tasks and reach positions of considerable responsibility in wealthy households, sometimes in charge of other slaves. In practice, many of the richer and more privileged slaves were more, um, more privileged than the impoverished free pe peasants, although other slaves worked on the estates and silver mines and were still, in effect, chattel slaves. So over the centuries, Roman scholars made laws and developed legal principles to deal with familiar issues. The status of children, relations between slaves and free men, forms of sale, how to deal with runaways, wrongs committed by or to slaves. They restricted the status of slavery to captives and those born of slave parents, effectively excluding debt bondage. But they also recognized people with intermediate status, like concubines. And during the empire, the various types of manumission and its consequences caused complex legal problems. Manumission didn't make somebody entirely free. They had ongoing obligations to the master, again, about which much has been written. And unless he was manumitted, a slave couldn't enter into business relations that were binding on his master, however competent he was. In these ways, he was like a son, as the laws recognized. It was a basic legal principle that the father owned all the family property. If they sent a son or a slave to negotiate a deal, it couldn't act like an agent. So in these ways, the laws actually cause difficulties, particularly for the merchant classes. So by the time of the late empire, slaves still had a distinct status. But in their degrees of freedom, wealth, and power, they weren't always inferior to so-called free men. And there were great variations among the slave property uh, population. Nevertheless, in the second century of the Common Era, the jurist Gaius declared that everybody was either a slave or not. And this statement was re repeated in the Corpus Juris Civilis, the great law code commissioned by Justinian in the sixth century. It hardly helped to clarify anything. And the reason I would suggest is not because the distinction was so obvious, but because it had become so complicated. And it was certainly no longer really a marker of freedom. Slavery had almost become an anomalous state, but one that the Romans clearly found it useful to maintain.
To complicate matters still further, the lawmakers tried to justify slavery by saying that natural law treated everyone equally. And it was the jus gentium, the laws of other nations, the rules common to non-Romans, that had introduced slavery into Roman society. They were suggesting that we, civilised Romans, would never enslave our own people. It was a barbarian practice, imported like slaves themselves from elsewhere. And another passage claims completely unconvincingly that etymologically the word for slave, servi, comes to the word meaning to spare, that is to spare the lives of war captives. In any event, in Imperial Rome there was a large class of slaves and the lawmakers continued to insist on their distinct status. But it was very difficult to rationalise the category, even to say what it meant. It masked, a much, it masked a much more complicated set of dependencies and freedoms. And at the same time, at least some people were clearly troubled by the idea that Romans had, and still could, reduce people to the status of things. So we find similar concerns in the Islamic world. By the time of Justinian, the Roman Empire had expanded far to the east, where its armies confronted the Sasanians from Persia. And it was about the time of Justinian that Islam was born in Arabia in the early 7th century, just a bit later than Justinian. Slavery was then a social fact in the Middle East. The practices of slaving war captives and debt bondage had continued from the times of the Assyrian and Babylonian kings. So in the Quran and in practice, Muhammad dealt with slavery as an existing fact. The Quran used a simple concept of ownership to refer to war captives, concubines and others. And he uses slavery as an example when discussing the nature of property. Although he does emphasise that freeing slaves is an act of benevolence. And the new religion created an important distinction between Muslims and infidels. Legal scholars were soon declaring that a believer could not enslave a fellow Muslim, even a war captive. Only those captured in a holy war, a jihad, or those born of two, born of two slave parents could be slaves. Like the Romans, they effectively abolished debt bondage. But this created problems. The Abbasid Caliphate in 820 can be roughly mapped onto the spread of um, Islam itself. Um, people found their enemies could be Muslims, and captured people could claim to have converted. Yet much of the economy under the Islamic Caliphate depended on slaves, so they had to be brought in from even further. And there's evidence of extensive slave trading over the centuries. In time, not surprisingly, the Islamic scholars introduced restrictions on the treatment of slaves and granted them freedoms. They allowed slaves to marry non-slaves. They made it clear that masters had duties to care for their slaves and could free them. An owner could manumit his slaves in, in their will, and slaves could buy their freedom. So it was clearly possible for many slaves to acquire property and independence. They dealt with ch children of mixed marriages, with slaves acting as guardians, where the slaves formed parts of their master's property for the purpose of calculating the zakat, the religious tax, the position of emancipated slaves, penalties for injuring a slave, although they were less than those for, for freemen, how to treat slaves who converted to Islam, which couldn't be sold to infidels, whether slaves could do testimony in court, occasionally, perform rig religious functions, no, even whether they could act as a judge, also no. But how could slaves even think of acting as judges? Although economically, many Muslim societies depended on slaves, which they imported in large numbers, the boundaries of the category had obviously become blurred. Many slaves must have been in practice indistinguishable from ordinary people if they could acquire enough resources to buy their own freedom and enough legal expertise to think of acting as judges. Despite this, like the Roman scholars, Muslim jurists maintained a simple distinction. In fact, they defined freedom in terms of slavery. To be free was not to be a slave, either socially or morally. You were free if you were not subject to authority or in the grip of bad personal qualities. So slavery also provides a useful metaphor. You could be emotionally a slave. But I think behind all this, in moral and religious terms, what really mattered to the Muslims was not so much freedom as the distinction between themselves and the infidels and how they should act as good Muslims. The Islamic scholars were more concerned about what it meant to be a moral person, 
at manumitting slaves than what it meant to be free. On the other hand, in practice, their economies needed slavery. They needed to affirm the category. And the lawmakers had to deal with the resulting legal complications. OK, to, to, wrap, to sum up a little bit so far. Um, so in all these societies, some people were in fact treated as property, particular war captives. And behind many laws is an assumption that people could be things without rights. And most laws made basic distinctions between chattel slaves, dependent outsiders who could be bought and sold, and others, generally those in debt bondage, which might include fellow citizens, and who generally had more rights. But most laws also dealt with the resulting complications, the degrees of dependency, ambiguities in status, elements of personhood. And in practice, as we've seen, the status was unstable. Slaves built up personal relations, reproduced, acquired useful skills, had roots to manumission. So in most cases, um, they maintained a basic conceptual distinction between slaves and others because it was practically useful. For different reasons, they wanted to maintain a class of dependent people as servants, laborers, concubines, or simply as a response to the problems of indebtedness. They weren't trying to abolish slavery. And it could be a useful way to mark out insiders and outsiders. Hammurabi, um, the Israelites, the Islamic scholars, used slavery to define those who belonged morally, who were entitled to protection, who couldn't be reduced to utter dependency. And both the Chinese rulers and Hindu Brahmins used the category of slavery const to construct a social hierarchy within their own societies to mark out an underclass of penal laborers or a whole caste of servants. But over time, these distinctions gave rise to moral problems. Both Romans and Islamic scholars restricted classes of slavery and the extent to which anyone could treat another person as a piece of property. I don't want to suggest that the Romans or Muslims were more moral than their predecessors. These developments are more a function of the complexity of their societies and the history of the slavery, which needed to be managed. But this in turn forced them to think about the moral implications of their practices. Creating laws on slavery meant that people had to face the fact that they had the capacity to treat people as property. So my final two examples come from a later period where we find legal drafters going to some lengths to deny that's what they're doing. The first is from medieval Dubrovnik. By the 13th century, a thriving city-state on the Adriatic with a flourishing trade in textiles and slaves. Here, as in most of medieval Europe, they followed the jus commune, the civil law, which was largely derived from the Roman, which provided that slaves could be born to a slave mother, captured in battle, or sold by themselves to pay a debt. By the Middle Ages, many people in Dubrovnik were literate and recorded sales and other transactions, including contracts of self-sale and transfers of slaves. But interestingly, these in these documents, we commonly find clauses indicating that the slave, him or herself, has consented to the sale. Here's one. I, Debrenia, son of Zutas from Trogir, record that I gave and sold myself of my own free will, mea bona voluntate, as a slave. Or, Joannes sold his slave, I'm not going to pronounce the name, from Bosnia, who was present and consenting, presentum et consentium. It's highly unlikely the slaves were actually consenting, at least not without considerable compulsion. So why did anyone maintain that they did? Well, maybe the owners were afraid that the slaves would later claim that they'd been wrongfully enslaved, which did happen. But these clauses also probably indicated moral unease with the fact of slavery. Christian thought was already presenting with ethical dilemmas. The canon lawyers accepted slavery, but the Fourth Lateran Council introduced baptism and marriage as sacraments. So what was to be done with Christian slaves? As Christians, they were entitled to sacraments, but slaves couldn't validly enter marriage contracts. As the historian Hannah Skoda point, puts it, there was a growing idea that people mattered, even if they were slaves. So maybe these clauses these clauses at least gave the impression that everything was okay because the slave had consented to their status. It salved their consciences. And the evidence is less clear, but something similar was maybe happening in pre-modern Tibet. Finally, the place where I do my fieldwork. Um, 
up until the early 20th century, this was largely an agricultural society with large landed estates. This is actually from Ladakh where I do my field work, but you, know, you get the idea in these tiny little villages and rocky landscapes. And in central Tibet, there were these large estates where many people lived as serfs, effectively. Farmers could borrow money or grain, but had to pay extraordinarily high rates of interest. So not surprisingly, many of them became hopelessly impoverished. And then they might have to sell themselves or their family members into debt bondage. Jinian Bischoff, who's worked on some of these documents, um, has analysed one relatively typical document, which records that four siblings had inherited a large debt from their mother, which they divided between them. One of the siblings was unable to pay his share, so the siblings together gave him to a richer man in return for clearing the debt. The brother was to become a slave for life. Presumably the debt was so large that he could never expect to work it off. And as typical, the document begins, we, whose names and seals are clear below, have submitted completely, voluntarily and unalterably to these obligations. And it later records, out of great gratitude, our brother is given voluntarily and completely for his whole life to the rich man. As Bischoff analyses it, Expressions of gratitude from poor to rich, from lower to higher classes, were common in these documents. Acknowledge, but acknowledging so-called benevolence served to recognise and strengthen the social hierarchy and power relations. It masked what were probably more like relations of domination and coercion. Expressions of both gratitude and slavery, and voluntary submission to slavery, were probably also ways to address moral concerns masking the fact that some people were effectively being forced into slavery and made the property of others. Buddhism didn't forbid slavery, but also didn't condone it. So in both these cases, we see practices of debt bondage, which are obviously common, well accepted by the majority of the population. But once the transactions were reduced to writing, everybody had to face up to the reality that people were being reduced to the state of dependency to pieces of property with all the moral issues that that entailed. So what's the significance of all this? I just want to end with a few thoughts on, um, on the wider implications. Um, starting with an academic debate which really took place in the 1980s about what slavery is. And at this stage, some anthropologists working with African material challenged models used by those working particularly on the Atlantic slave trade, who, they said, had a rather simplistic idea of what it was to be a slave. Igor Kopitov, um, in his article, says, well, it's easy to describe slaves as property, but what does that mean? Property is not a simple concept. It involves bundles of rights and can vary enormously. In some African societies, family members, especially sons and wives, could also be treated as property. They couldn't, they couldn't own their own property. They could be forced to work. Daughters were exchanged in marriage. There's payment of bride wealth, rather as we've seen in Rome um, and in the Hindu society. We wouldn't want to describe all of these as slavery, but it's a matter of degree. There are no hard and fast lines between slavery and freedom. And there are equal problems with the concept of freedom, which isn't important in many societies, as we've also seen in some of my examples. Slavery might have been contrasted with citizenship, other forms of belonging, protection, belonging to a higher caste, right, religious rights, of the right religion. And he pointed out the great variety in statuses of slaves. And the, state of, the fact that status wasn't often stable. People might start as complete outsiders, as dependents, but gradually become insiders, acquire forms of status. And much of this has been very evident in the laws I've described here. Against Kopitov, Claude Messayou objected to the blurring of the line between slaves and kin. Both may involve subordination, he said, but slavery results from alienation. It involves depersonalization the social incapacity of the slave to reproduce socially, to become kin. And the sociologist Orlando Patterson describes slavery as an extreme state. He emphasizes the elements of violent domination, alienation, and dishonor. He talks about slaves as socially isolated and parasitically de degraded. And David Graeber talks about people being ripped from their contexts, a slave as a person who would otherwise be dead. And I want to suggest that there's something in both these views. What Mayasu, Patterson and Graeber describes is the extreme form of chattel slavery, the result of capture, typically in war, the most complete form of dependency, 
where people are literally ripped from their context and denied the support of kin and social networks, which is the reality for many. As we've seen here, enslavement is a physical act which doesn't need a legal definition. <coughs> But the evidence of the early laws also supports Kopitov's view that slavery was a state that was difficult to maintain. People built up social relations, particularly women who had children, and economic distress pushed many ordinary people into debt bondage. Often laws are trying to deal with a mass of difficult relations and states of dependency. It's when law became necessary. Hanging on to the simple binary between slavery and freedom, I've suggested, was an attempt to confirm the status of slavery, something practically useful for the privileged and powerful, despite these complications. But as I've also said, this also forced lawmakers to think about what it meant to be a slave, to face fundamental moral issues about themselves and their society, how slavery was justified, what were its limits were, could they reduce their own people to slavery. Maintaining a simple binary between slavery and freedom might have entrenched practically useful social relations, but it also forced the lawmakers to face up to the nature of their societies and ask what it meant to be civilised. Thank you.